Hansa Heath Estate. Got it. Uh, a Hansa Heath Estate. Um, I just want to say that the fire safety works on the um, Hansa Heath Estate have been completed. Almost all of the flats in the uh, two towers have had sprinkler systems installed, as well as the communal areas. This was obviously as a follow on from what happened at Grenfell. A small number of tenants refused access um, to enable the work to proceed, but obviously these will be dealt with individually in the future um, should the tenancy change. Um, and the work obviously did take a little longer than anticipated because of COVID, but actually mainly because there was such a high demand for the contractors who could carry out that type of work um, following on from Grenfell. Um, community centres, um, we were been trying to support the community centre on Percy Road um, during the lockdown and as we emerged from the pandemic, Liz, John and Leslie are directly involved in the, uh, in the centre and we're in regular contact with the manager and other trustees. Um, we're obviously also um, trying to improve the usage of the RHP community centre on the Hounslow Heath Estate and we're currently looking for volunteers to open up a children's library on site. Uh, local area fund. Last year, Heathfield Council has supported three bids. Uh, the Friends of Heathfield Rec bid to improve green spaces in the Wickham and Woodlawn estates. Food for Thoughts mobile pop-up surplus food stall in the Rec, which has uh, been doing great work. Uh, and the Wild Mind a project providing nature-based activities for children and young people. Um, we get a fund of around £10,000 each year uh, to spend. And obviously last year, that was what the, the 10000 was allocated towards. And we've got a new pot for this coming year. And so if you, um, you or a resident or organisation has got some ideas about how to spend that money, then please do get in touch with us. Um, we'd really like to uh, support some bids going forward. Uh, CPZ enforcement and review, as many of you will know, we've had a new CPZ, well it's not so much new anymore, it's been in place um, since, the, uh, since the first lockdown, in fact it came in in March 2020, and uh, we've been at various, asked at various points over the last year about enforcement, um, and I get regular updates about enforcement both in the CPZ and on the high street after concerns have been raised about drop off at the station being abused. And um, the CPZ is being policed, but obviously we only have a limited number of enforcement officers across the borough, but they do regularly patrol and tickets are issued. Um, the review, which should have happened after implementation but was delayed because of the pandemic, will take place. Um, I had confirmed by officers in uh, the middle of November, we're hoping to um, kick that off. Uh, but um, the lack of painted bays has been already acknowledged and also a lack of short stay bays close to the dentist on Percy Road have been flagged. Uh, Crane Park, um, joint work with Hounslow Council and Hounslow local police teams um, following pressure from us and the local MP additional signage has been secured on the Hounslow side of Crane Park where the, the entry issues were occurring and police patrols have been stepped up following antisocial behaviour relating to the motorcycles uh, that were going into the park. Uh, we've been alerted to some further antisocial behaviour um, which is taking place at the moment in relation to other issues and the police have been notified and they're following up with that. And my final one um, is just on Powder Mill Lane and Hanworth Road. Obviously, we're talking about the high streets this evening. Um, uh, earlier this year, local councillors, MP and uh, the council business lead, Councillor Baker, uh, spoke to a number of shop owners and staff in the small shopping parade, as well as listening to their concerns. We're promoting some of the council initiatives and we're also looking for a community access point to enable residents in this part of the ward uh, in order to pick up library books. Um, there is also, as many of you will know, there is the, um, the pub, which has been closed for a while now. There is a planning application, another a new planning application has gone in in relation to the Duke of York pub um, and obviously that's um, being looked at by officers at the moment. That's us for Heathfield. Councillor, thank you very much and a good segue at the end there into the topic of discussion tonight which is high streets and how people interact with them but let's go to Witten next. Uh, Councillor Joe Humphreys. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so, uh, starting off, the I suppose the, the big new news in Witten is the fact that Nella Hall uh, has been sold um, and that it has been purchased by uh, an organisation called Duke's Education. Uh, Duke's Education uh, is, uh, own and run um, a group of different uh, private uh, schools. Um, and the idea is that they have bought Nella Hall in order to open um, a secondary school or upper school, as they would call it, for Radnor House. So Radnor House is currently um, in central Twickenham and it's quite a small site which is shared between both the um, 
what we would call a junior school um, and their secondary school. And the idea is that they're going to move the secondary school to Nella Hall um, and um, be able to expand the secondary school because they'll have the space. Um, and then they're going to make their junior school like, effectively into a primary school. So I think they start at year four at the moment. They will then start in reception instead. So they're going to have a bit more space uh, to do that. Um, Councillor Yeager and I um, were able to secure a meeting with um, uh, Mr Hassan, who is the chairman of Duke's Education. He's also, I think, the chair of uh, Board of Governors at Radnor House itself. Um, and we met him on site and had a walk uh, around the site to start getting an idea of what uh, they, their plans are. It's very, very early stages. They're nowhere near anything like a planning application. Um, although they're, they're being ambitious, they, they are hoping to open the school in September 2023. So not uh, not very far into the into the future, but we were able to walk around the site and start to get a feeling uh, for the sort of things that they want to do. Um, obviously, there are certain things they have to do. Any purchaser would have had to do it. So they are going to be obviously preserving uh, the main hall because um, that's a, a grade two listed. Um, they're going to be preserving the chapel in the middle of the hall. They're going to be preserving the guard house. All of these were listed. So anybody, as I said, purchasing would have had to do that. Um, and then a lot of the boundary walls and railings are also listed. So they would have to protect those as well. Um, and also they're obviously very aware that the large green open space, which is between the hall and Chase Bridge Primary School, that's metropolitan open land with lots and lots of uh, trees that have PTOs, are protected trees. Um, and, and so all of that has to be taken into consideration. And uh, the good news also is that uh, they clearly were extremely aware of this supplementary planning document, which is a document that we, we worked on over the last few years um, so that we could try and have some influence over what was going to happen with that site, which was always going to be a private sale between the Ministry of Defence and whoever purchased it. But the supplementary planning document at least gives us some tools in which to um, help guide uh, the, the, the new purchaser of the site. And obviously that SPD was put together after we consulted uh, with uh, the community in, in Witten and Heathfield to find out uh, what people would like to see happen with that site. As I said, very, very early stages, um, but he went through a variety of sports facilities that they're hoping to put on the site. Um, a lovely thing that he talked about is right at the back of the site, um, they will want to have an ecological corridor um, which is effectively going to be an outside classroom, an outside learning tool, uh, which will be made available to local schools, but also local community groups like Cubs or Scouts or Brownies and, and things like that. So that's a, a nice opportunity. And obviously things like rugby pitches, football pitches, a swimming pool, um, a sports hall, uh, a mugger, uh, lots of things like that. Uh, they're obviously as part of their, their school um, uh, they're going to be building um, and also they're very keen to maintain the uh, the very large for those of you've been there outside bandstand um, uh, with the idea of hopefully continuing that lovely tradition of um, open air concerts and performances and things like that so that's going to be be, be lovely to see obviously uh, we said to them that there were two things that were very important to our, to, to our community. Uh, the first one was to have as much community access and community use to those facilities as possible. Um, so, you know, they're going to hopefully build lots and lots of lovely things, and we hope that they are going to be made available uh, to, to the residents and, and the community in Whitton and Heathfield. Um, but additionally, they are aware that this school will be opening in a area where there is already a three form entry primary school a five form entry secondary school in RTS just across the 316 and also a six form college. So there's obviously a lot of education establishments in quite a small area. And it's really, really important that the infrastructure, both in terms of public transport, uh, cycling, pedestrians, and any vehicles that are coming into the area, we need to make sure that that is done in a way that is safe uh, and not detrimental to those living in the area. So we made that very, very clear. And the last thing we made clear was how important it is that they engage with the local community. Uh, we don't want the engagement to start literally as we get to the planning point, which is obviously then they, they, it's compulsory. They have to engage with the community. And they seem very open to the idea of having 
community conversations, either in person or a bit like we're having here this evening, in order to really get a feel for, for how the local community feel about, about them coming into the area and, and how we can make it a really positive thing for everyone living here. Um, so that's obviously the, the, big, the big thing that's happened recently. The other thing that I'm sure everybody is aware and, and concerned about is the proposals from the Boundary Commission. Um, as you may know, the Boundary Commission have had to reduce down the size of constituencies. There's a figure that they have to hit 5% either side. Uh, and Twickenham apparently is too big. Um, and so because of that, they're looking to basically take some of Twickenham constituency out of there and put it into a different constituency. And unfortunately, uh, they have at the moment, the proposal is to uh, remove Witten from the Twickenham constituency and put it into the Hounslow constituency. Doesn't affect local authority. Everyone still remains part of Richmond Borough. Um, but uh, we're very uh, concerned about this and we put in a very strongly worded objection uh, in the consultation that has now closed. Um, we feel that it is not beneficial for Witten for this to happen. Uh, we think that it splits. Um, I mean, you know, here the fact we're all sat here as Witten and Heathfield and we're going to be discussing our shared high street and our, you know, all the things that we do together. We are a community together. We are one community. And to split us over two constituencies uh, is endangering those fantastic local ties uh, that we all have. Um, and also in terms of Witten, it creates what we call an orphan ward where Witten would literally be the only ward in the Hounslow um, constituency that is in Richmond Borough. All the other part of the constituency is in Hounslow Borough. And it has been proven again that if you are one small area that is in a different local authority, representation um, can be um, quite uh, difficult. Um, so we will be continuing to fight this um, because we don't think it's the right decision to, uh, to be made. Um, and we're very, very keen, obviously, to keep the community together. Very briefly on the local area fund, which Councillor Wilson mentioned, this is the £10,000 that we have each year to spend on local projects. Uh, so far, Witten, uh, we have uh, given half the money uh, with Heathfield um, towards the uh, Wild Mind project, which is using nature to help people with mental health. Um, and the other projects that we've given is we've given some money to Friends of Murray Park, uh, who are going to be uh, running and organising a, a junior park run, which we're very much looking forward to. My kids aren't. I've said my kids have to do it now. But they're not very happy. But anyway, I think junior park run is going to be, be terrific. So we've uh, given some money to, to uh, Friends of Murray Park for that. Um, and the other project uh, is a new play therapy um, group that has started up in the old caretaker's house at Chase Bridge School, and they're called Purple Elephant. Do look them up. Um, unfortunately, I mean, it was happening anyway, but it's been exaggerated, uh, become more increased by the pandemic, uh, where there are very sadly, uh, we're seeing mental health problems in children of primary school age. I think we're all being very aware of children of secondary school age, but primary school age, unfortunately, we're starting to see mental health issues in, in our younger children. Um, and the Purple Elephant Project very much um, is geared towards that age group where they do therapy through play. And so we gave them some money to create a play therapy garden um, at, at the Purple Elephant Project. Uh, they're doing fun, terrific work, really wonderful to, to uh, be able to support them. And as I said, do look them, them up if you want to find out a little bit more um, about them. Um, just adding on quickly to uh, what Michael has said about all the work that we're doing on Hospital Bridge Road and that whole corridor study, um, Sometimes I think it, it, we forget that it's not just about the Heathfield side of, of the railway bridge, but also we really need to have a good look at the Witten side uh, of Hospital Bridge Road with that junction with Nelson Road. It's very, very tricky for uh, drivers turning right out of there, for example. Very difficult for people uh, crossing over because, of course, with there only been a pavement on one side of the bridge, people coming from uh, the north side of um, uh, Nelson Road and Collingwood Road uh, and, and all of the houses up at that side, uh, they have to cross over Hospital Bridge Road to get on the side where there's a pavement and so there's lots of work happening about that junction making sure there's a safe crossing looking at um 
the width of the, the pavement and the railings of the pavement and all of those things on that railway bridge, um, but also um, how one crosses uh, Nelson Road as well to get to Hospital Bridge Road. So lots of work going on there uh, to, to make that um, as, as safe and accessible as possible. Um, then the second to last thing um, is that um, we're obviously very, very concerned about Southwest Railways um, proposals to drastically cut the train services to Witten Station. Uh, we've done lots of work on that. We're giving leaflets out there, making sure everyone um, was responding to the consultation which has has now closed and obviously both ourselves as local councillors but also um the, the council in general have put in um a response to that consultation saying that it's unacceptable they are jumping the gun in terms of saying well look how empty our trains are we, we you know we're going to cut the services we all know that we are not back to normal post pandemic yet that the people are still finding their feet in terms of how much they're working from home versus how much they're you know working in the office and to be making timetable decisions now we think is very premature um, and uh, can could be very very detrimental and it leads very nicely Paul which I'll hand over to you in a second into what you'll be talking about this evening is the fact that we have this train station serving our high street as obviously as well as commuters and we've had very positive feedback about the 110 bus route which changed which then linked into Witten High Street um, and we have finally got that sort of bus route and that bus link that we wanted and we see potentially the trains being cut and also of course we've lost all of our banks on the high street as well which I'm sure we'll be talking about uh, this evening as well um, and so um, lots of work to, to be done on persuading um, the train services that this is not the time to be cutting um, the train services to Witten. You know, we're a, a thriving um, area with commuters, but also a really important commercial high street, and we need those trains, that train station, uh, and with good services. So uh, that's something that uh, we uh, continue um, to campaign on behalf of local residents about. So thank you very much, Paul. Well, thank you very much. It seems to me, actually, having listened to those updates and all the ones that I've heard through the summer, that the one thing that COVID hasn't done is produce the size of the in tray for councillors. So well done to all of you. Now, I'm going to get everybody into the rooms by seven o'clock, he said in a determined fashion. So uh, let me just uh, tell you where this follows on from. Your discussion tonight follows on from a uh, wider conference held in May that I was lucky enough to attend. And five themes emerged from that. Five themes as to what Richmond's high streets might start to prioritise. There's no question high streets are changing. They're changing up and down the country. Yours are going to be no different, uh, but some of the changes that are happening elsewhere, you'll begin to see if you're not seeing them so far. So the five themes that came through were residents saying, we want our town centres to become destinations, places where we don't necessarily need to go, but places where, where we are really incentivised to want to go. Theme number one. Theme number two, Let's make sure that our high streets and uh, shopping parades are centred around people, not necessarily centred around businesses. Of course, they have to operate effectively, but centred around what we want to find there. Theme number three was let's make sure we end up with a more balanced footprint. And some of the vacancies on high streets and shopping parade gives a chance to fill vacant units, not just with retailers, but with other kinds of very, very uh, different kinds of use that you may have seen on high streets in the past. Theme number four was particularly a shout out to planners and developers and investors to be really creative and not just think about introducing the same old and the same old. Let's repurpose spaces for something different. And then theme number five was the elephant in every room in every discussion like this up and down the country, which is I can sit at home and get everything on my mobile phone if I want to. But how can we get our high streets to make my mobile phone operate even differently when I'm there? So how do we digitalize that experience? Those are the themes that came through. Now, the conversation you're going to have in two or three minutes links into a wider piece of work, which is the local plan. And very quickly, I'm going to ask Grace just to run through how this piece of work fits within the local planning exercise. Grace. Thanks, Paul. Good evening, everyone. I will make this quick because um, I know we're tight for time this evening. Um, but yeah, my name is Grace and I'm here from Planning Policy to give a very quick overview of the local plan, what this means for your local area and how this connects with some of the things that we'll be discussing this evening. 
Um, so this kind of maps out some of the internal council areas that work collaboratively to produce the local plan. Um, and we, we do collaborate to make sure that the planning decisions that we're making um, have been done to the best of our ability and are, you know, good decisions that, um, uh, sorry, <laughs> um, to explore the impact of, of developments and yeah, we don't only undertake this process internally, this is something that we also do in collaboration with you all in the community. And at several stages throughout the planning process, we'll be inviting you all to take part as we recognise how knowledgeable you are in your areas. And although there are many areas that are outside council control, we also do work with land landlords and landowners to influence future developments. Um, but it's worth mentioning that factors like land ownership and high land value and demand for certain uses like housing um, do influence planning policy. And um, for those of you that don't know, the local plan is a legal document that is produced by each local authority in England. Typically, this is done once every 10 years, but um, in some instances and in what we've decided to do in Richmond is review it a bit sooner. Um, and we've reviewed it after five. Um, and this is due to changes like climate change, um, changes to central government planning policy, but also to reflect things like the new London plan and the ambitious housing targets um, that are constantly a pressure. And the local plan, I think it's really important to, to be clear that it does not um, always adopt policies that are most popular or fall in line with individual interests, but aims to balance the needs of all users um, of places and members of society. Um, so this would mean making sure that developments are placed in the most appropriate places, um, shaping how places look and feel, and influencing how we travel and how we get around. It does not do things like cap property prices or reduce chain shops um, or control parking or um, how often waste and recycling is collected. And to give an example about what one of these policies might look like in practice, this is a 20 minute neighbourhood concept and this diagram represents the idea that our places and our local areas should be complete and compact, um, where most things you need are a short walk or cycle away. And um, for many, you know, we've really, the pandemic and the fact that we're usually spending more time at home has emphasised how important these places are. Um, and this is something that the local plan is very keen to emphasize. And as well as the five larger centers in Richmond, there are about 30 local centers and uh, parades across the borough, which are really important for things like top up shopping, especially for those without access to a car or people that just want to make the most of their local businesses. Um, and going forward, we need to make sure that these places have what they need, that they're successful, they're distinctive, um, and they can adapt to change either through shopping habits or things like um, use class legislation. And we know that er each area is different, which is the purpose of evenings like this. So we can hear from you all about what you value in your areas and what uh, ideas you might have to improve things in the future. And all of these thoughts and opinions will feed into the way uh, that we're producing the local plan. Uh, this slide, I won't go into it in a huge amount of detail, but just to reassure you that the plan is, um, it's a very long process to produce, um, to, to produce the plan. And as part of that, the council commissions a new set of research to help inform the decisions that we're making. Um, this includes an urban design study to look at the character of each area, but also things like a review of the open land designations um, and the uh, needs in terms of businesses, and housing, retail and leisure facilities. And the bit that we're kind of uh, at this point here, just between these two, two dots. So the first draft of the local plan is being produced and the consultation window is due to begin in December of this year and run until the end of January next year. So do keep an eye on that um, because we will be inviting you all to comment. And just to summarise, we are setting a long term vi vision for Richmond, uh, which looks up to 15 years in the future, it reflects on the, the changes that we've experienced recently, um, but also works to deliver for the community, building on our borough's strengths, um, emphasising its fantastic cultural and leisure facilities, the presence of the river and um, everything that it has to offer. And we want to make sure we're working with you to ensure that this division is developed collaboratively. Thank you, I'll hand back to Paul.
Good on you, Grace. Uh, thank you very much. Right. OK, hold on to your hats. Get yourself a gin and tonic. We're going to move you into a breakout room now where it's over to you. You've heard an awful lot so far, but this is what we want to hear. What do you think of your high street and how would it improve? There are three questions that the facilitators are going to put to you. You're going to have half an hour to go through those questions. I'll join the various rooms. And at the end of it, I'll try and consolidate some of those thinkings. As you go through it, if you've got questions for your counsellors, you go to the chat function at the bottom, type the question in there. I will make sure the counsellors get asked it. The three questions we're asking you in the next 30 minutes are, number one, we want to know how you use your town centre. Has the way you use it changed since COVID? Do you use it more in the evening, more in the day? When do you go there? How do you get there? And what kind of businesses are you using when you're on the high street? Number two, we want to know what you'd like to see on your high street. It might be absolutely perfect. You might want no change at all, but you might want more green spaces, the pavements used for different things, different kinds of shops, leisure uses, whatever, whatever you say. And then third, think big, be realistic. But what's your big idea? What's the idea that you'd really like to see put into your high street that would make it different to any other? So the rules of the game are this. Be positive, be constructive, think big, think different and try and enjoy yourself for the next half an hour. Right, we're gonna move you into some breakout rooms. You do nothing, then in half an hour's time, we'll bring you all back in and we'll try and bring the conversation together. Enjoy yourselves. Right, everybody, I'm sorry if we shortened your discussions there. I was, um, the, the great thing with these evenings is I visit the rooms one by one, is they're always off to a fairly slow start with people sort of vaguely introducing who they are and what their background is, and by the end of it, you basically can't shut anybody up. Fantastic, well done, really good. So I visited all of the rooms two or three times and I'll just give you an overview of some of the stuff that I heard. Uh, in one room they were saying, we've got a decent high street, it could be better, it's nothing outstanding. We've gone there more, we've walked a bit more, we've started to discover some new areas, but we are still quite cautious after COVID, particularly eating and drinking. In another room though they were saying, but one of the highlights of our high street is we love the local food. We've got a great range of uh, restaurants. Uh, and somebody said, do you know what? Just pick the Witten Community Centre up and plonk it right in the middle of Witten. It's in the wrong place. Uh, another group was saying, we've got a good selection uh, of stores. We like the fact that lots of small shops give us what we really like. And we like to buy local, some of that community spirit that's come through uh, through COVID. Um, another person said, I definitely, definitely now try and use local businesses more. Somebody else said, though, we don't want another pizza shop. Uh, delivery drivers are an issue. That's coming through in a lot of towns and cities and high streets now. And somebody else said, just pedestrianise more and more space. Another group said, we love to have food markets, street markets, particularly a farmer's market. Come on, let's get a routine of these going. And in another group, they were saying, where there's a vacant unit, we should have a policy that we immediately dress the vacant frontage so that it becomes another reason to go there, not another reason not to go there. And somebody else was saying, let's have lots of local events. Trick or treating was one idea. Um, the other group, another group said, uh, we want more independent businesses. If a multiple business closed down, let's try and emphasize the need to bring in somebody local. Somebody else said, let's put more seating there. I'd like to stay there longer, but I can't sit down. Um, and somebody else said, actually, I really like the fact that I can go to my high street without my car. Hold that thought, though, because another group disagreed. Um, somebody else said, I feel really, really sad that I've still got to go to the big supermarkets too often. I can't get everything I need on the high street. And somebody else said, widen the pavements and let's use the pavements for street trading. One group discussed there is increased antisocial behaviour, particularly young people drinking on the streets. And then somebody else was saying, let's bring more organic produce. Another group talked about the enviable, but often unfortunate competition you get from Kingston and Richmond, two strong centres that pull you uh, either side of where you are. Another group said, let's have more leisure, particularly more stuff for kids. And there was a discussion about accessibility, particularly for those that are not able bodied. Here we go, too much traffic people driving around looking for a free car parking space. We need to close the streets on Sundays and the evenings and have traffic free. Low cost gym was wanted by somebody else. Better signage, digital signage, uh, remove some of the free car parking. 
let's all encourage ourselves to buy less but visit more often that's a really interesting strategy and let's repurpose the car park and bring in a toy shop anyway there were three bits that i really liked first of all i heard a group talking about a vietnamese street food offer that was coming but wasn't on the street and was in a in a shop how strange is that um somebody else challenged did anybody else in the group could anybody else in the group claim that they have not been hit or nearly hit by an electric scooter i did have to say that i'm from ipswich in suffolk and we've only just got rid of the horse and cart so electric scooters are not here but i was in an absence of one and finally this was truly random but one group ended up as the percy road residence meeting they were all from percy road they all knew each other they came from hugely different political backgrounds but got on like a house on fire so i'm looking to move to percy road and well done to graham wood whose backdrop uh, on his zoom link said simply that he loved witten that's great listen well done everybody uh, really good stuff uh, a huge amount and the councillors will ensure that now goes into their committee process so let's move to questions please for some of the councillors all of the councillors come off mute i'm not going to pick on you shout out if you want to take this question stay silent if you don't and if you all stay silent then i will have to pick on somebody let's deal with john keith's question here and i don't know the building john forgive me but one of your councillors will nella hall what will happen to the existing base housing housing are we facing the prospect of lots of social housing which of the councillors would like to take that um, I'll answer that. Um, so I think the first thing we have to clarify is that there is housing on uh, Duke of Cambridge uh, close, just to, I think some people are asking about that. That housing was not part of the sale. That housing still exists and continues to exist. It's actually owned, it was sold, I can't remember the name of the organisation now, but the MOD sold all their housing stock, stock to a housing association and then rented it back. Um, and as far as I'm aware, it will still be MOD people living in, in, in those properties um, because obviously not everyone who lived in those properties worked at Nella Hall. Often they'll be commuting into, into central London to the Ministry of Defence and things like that. So that housing is, is separate. In terms of the site itself, um, potentially, uh, and again, it's a private sale, so it would be, be their decision, but it would be driven to an extent by what's in the SPD. Um, potentially, there could, still could be some housing uh, on the site. Um, nobody has made any comments or decisions uh, about that at the moment. The only thing that I would say, and I, I don't know if um, uh, how the, the quote from the question came across about, you know, lots of affordable or social housing. Um, I'm, I'm going to nail my colours to, to the mast here. Um, I support the building of social housing. I support the building of affordable housing. Um, I see in my work day to day, um, the difficult circumstances that people are living in, the overcrowding, the waiting for years and years and years on housing waiting lists. Um, and we, I, I genuinely believe that Whitten and Heathfield is a sort of community that want to help all of our members of the community. Um, and that if we can do that by ha having some affordable and social housing uh, in our area, um, that I think that is a good thing. I don't know, it's too early to say what may or may not happen okay, on the on. Nella Hall site, um, but it's something that you know I would welcome um, because we, we have uh, many families living in our community uh, that, that need uh, housing. Um, okay, and, uh, and, and, you know, we, we'll, we'll see what happens. All right, well said, uh, Councillor. Thank you very much. Important point made. Uh, Nick Dexter would like to know, uh, does anybody know what the planning brief for the Duke of York pub site is? And if we don't know what the planning brief is, what would the councillors like it to be? So who, whose ward is that in? Who can take it, that it, on? It's in Heathfield ward. I'm on the planning committee, so I can take that. Um, as far as I know, the, the site doesn't have a planning brief. Um, it's a bit small. Um, the plans that have come in so far, we've had two. Uh, the plans that have come in are for um, a, at the bottom, for, for there to be a shop, it was on the first plan going to be a co-op. Above the shop will be flats. As it comes into Powder Mill Lane, there would be a community centre 
and uh, its flats as well. The first scheme failed because it did not have the correct amount of affordable housing. It was appealed. The planning inspectorate backed the council's refusal. There is a second plan being put in with a slightly different design, but exactly the same um, mix of housing, a community centre and a shop at, on the Hamworth Road bit with parking in front of the shop. Uh, that doesn't have affordable housing either. So the likelihood of it getting planning permission will be minimal. What we as um, uh, an authority would like to see on that site is retail and social housing. Uh, whether we get that is another matter. Yeah, okay, thank you very much for that. And I think actually both those uh answers from the two councils so far show that councils have a role in bringing forward change but can't facilitate all of the change themselves you can influence you can seek discussion you can try and have a consensus but the end of the end the private sector needs to work with you as well um, can I refer to a couple of questions actually from uh, Babs and I think this is a really important point actually Babs makes a specific point which is that she lives in Rodney Road where there's a new building going up for the over 50s but the lighting in the cul-de-sac is very poor and then a further comment about actually some of the lighting in the uh, streets off the high streets is quite poor as well and I think what Babs is probably saying is does the council feel it might be appropriate whether the lighting's yours or not to do an audit of, of lighting and see where the issues may be would another of the councillors like to take that lighting off the main streets um I'll take that because um the high You're street not? and Rodney Road are areas which I am somewhat uh, responsible for in a way um Rodney Road, if memory serves, one has only half the house. It's one side is house and the other side is the rail line. So I don't know how that will affect the lighting, but I have um, been doing uh, canvassing and such forth down at Rodney Road. And yes, at night it gets very dark there, which is, um, I can see why some people would be feel less than safe going down that road at night and a lot with the um lights off the high street again i can see why that would be a problem having especially on the because as you all know well all the locals know there's the two back alleys behind the high street which a lot of the flats have access from and the ownership of that um is enough to drive anyone insane trying to figure out. So getting any lighting there would be a challenge. Um, anything with street light in, there's always people on both sides of it. So like some people want, obviously for public safety, you want more lighting. Um, there is um, some research which shows um, the color of lighting can affect mm -hmm. um, antisocial behavior with um, Apparently, blue lighting help having a profound effect on lowering um, antisocial behaviour. Well, actually, actually, let me chip in there. Sorry, I'm not. I, I'm wanting to take your point further. You mentioned blue lighting. Somebody else actually mentions blue flashing lighting, and let me tell you why. What they say, and it is Graham Wood who says it. Graham Wood with a fantastic backdrop on Zoom. Well done, Graham. Graham Wood <laughs> says there is still a lot of ASB in and around the high street. We desperately need more police presence. So let's extend it now. We're done lighting. Let's extend it into more police presence. And I'm getting a very, very strong thumbs up from Anne Lahif. Well, you don't have to take this, Rob. So another councillor can take it if you well, like. Let so me just finish with the lighting. What I will do is, seeing that we have a specific um, comment on Rodney Road, is I'll go to officers and bring that matter to their attention okay. and see what is, because obviously I don't know the full technical details of it. And with the well, there's some sort of restriction because there's a railway line there and mm. it's one of the things that I would rather I will bring up to officers because they should be able to give us a okay. lead on what we can do and if we've got residents in the area saying we want better lighting there then that is something we can take forward yeah. 
Okay, well, thank you very much for that. And I think that will be much appreciated. Babs has messaged me to say actually that she's lived in the area for a long time. She's never felt unsafe until recently, and she does now. So it's clearly an issue there. Uh, which of the other councils would like to take the issue of policing? I mean, clearly you don't run the police, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Obviously you don't. But uh, Leslie, I think you're uh, offering to chip in on this one, I hope. Either that we've hit your hand button by accident, in which case you've got it. So Councillor Leslie Polesh, police. Yes. Um... I'm very interested in community safety. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm losing my voice. I would um, recommend anybody, if they have any serious concerns and they're looking for a counsellor as a go-to person to contact, to please contact me. I have a very good relationship with my local SNT in Heathfield and also in Witton. Also, we've just um, got a new Safer Neighbourhood team inspector who used to be a Witton policeman who is very good. So I, I know I know about the antisocial behaviour down Whitton High Street um, because I see it, but I would recommend any, any of the residents, if they have a serious issue or concern and they're looking for, <clears throat> sorry, a counsellor to funnel it through to the police, obviously apart from reporting it online or if it's a crime, yeah. it, the appropriate yeah. channels, yeah. Um, to contact me. Councillor, I think that's a very generous offer as you lose your voice. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> that was what <laughs> was required. Well done. Uh, right, OK, now I don't know whether you can do this or not. Um, some councillors just shout out an answer for me, yes or no. Does the council own and run Murray Park? Yes or no? Yes. Oh, Joe, that might have been the wrong answer. <laughs> Umesh, <laughs> Umesh says this. Uh, Murray Park, please section off part of the park so that it is dog free. I love wandering in the park, and all I'm finding now is dogs have used it as a toilet. Is it possible to do that, Joe? I don't even know you can do it. Well, so there is a dog-free part of, of Murray Park, and it's the playground. So, so where the children are playing and all the playground equipment, that is dog-free. You can't have a dog uh, in there. Whether there is... I, I, yeah, I mean, there's a, for example, there's a dog free park of Murray of Murray Park, but they tend to be kind of small, circular, kind of fenced off bits. In terms of going for a walk around a park, I, I I can't see how one would make it dog free. I mean, it's 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 really important that dog owners pick up after themselves, and obviously, mm -hmm. it's illegal for them not to do that, and they can be fined. Um, I'm a dog owner, lovely Labrador called Oscar, always pick up his poo. Um, but, you know, it, it's really difficult because the park is there for everybody. So children, yeah. families, dog owners, you know. Um, but I mean, I can I can take that away. I mean, is, is Linda here from uh, Friends of Murray Park? Linda? No, she's oh, OK. Um, I mean, certainly I can I can have a chat with Linda okay. about that and right. also our parks department. Um, I don't think the answer is having it, it dog free, but what whether we can do something more in order to make sure that dog owners are responsible yeah. in their ownership. I think that I think be that would be very much appreciated. Caroline McKnight on a similar issue says antisocial behaviour in Murray Park is also an issue after four o'clock most days. I don't want to go there. Uh, right, OK, so uh, let's move to uh, another point then. Uh, Hannah Keats, uh, she welcomes the 20 mile an hour limit. People still speed excessively, they need to be slowed down. But actually, why don't we develop an active travel strategy for Witten on its own? I'm happy to volunteer to be part of it. Hang on, Hannah, you've probably just got yourself a job. Uh, <laughs> and the 20 minute neighbourhood is a really good concept from which to start. Many of the councillors like so we're, we're asking here for an active travel strategy for Witten. Which of the councillors would take that? One of the Witten councillors, I'm assuming. Um, my, um, Michael, do, do you've been looking at the active travel plan for the whole area. Did you want to answer this one? No, he wants the one away. Um, this is quite to uh, be fair. Sorry, it was I, I, I muted myself because I've got two small children running around downstairs. Um, so I, I, I haven't I haven't specifically looked at. Uh, obviously, we're looking at um, some of the uh, pedestrian and cycle measures relating to Hospital Bridge Road. But I, I totally agree. I think there is a. Uh, I think we need to have a discussion around a uh, the, the wider sort of um, 
sort of infrastructure and strategy in relation to improve the road for cyclists uh, looking at how we make sure that more people can walk to AD, um, who's already sent us some thoughts, Joan Gibson, who many of you on this uh, call this evening will know. She's sent us some thoughts about this and uh, we've relayed those to the community engagement team. Uh, I'm more than happy to uh, facilitate some sort of discussion where we can involve uh, Councillor Eamon and Councillor Mansfield who are part of the uh, the chair and the vice chair of the transport committee um, so we can take it forward. That would be great and actually earlier on today uh, somebody attending this sent me a link to uh, a website I don't know whose website it is but it's uh, wittonvillage.london um, and actually there's a really fascinating uh, bit on that website about how you could transform Witten into a 20 minute neighbourhood, which has been done in cities and towns around the globe. So it's a good place from which to start. And it talks quite a lot about active travel. Right. Let's go to the next question. Uh, John Keefe again, I think we had John Keefe already. Maybe not. Maybe doing him a disservice. Um, uh, beyond the high street, we need separated cycle paths along Witten Dean between Witten Road and the Tesco store and along Nelson Road, Warren Road and Witten Road. You've thought this through, John, haven't you? Uh, from the Nelson Pub Junction to the stadium. So I think this is all about safe cycleways. Don't worry too much about the routes. Which of the Witten councillors might wish to take that? <laughs> I probably better not because my idea would be to get rid of all cars because I'm very pro-cycling. Um, yes, it is something that we need. As, you know, a keen cyclist, um, it's the main way I get around. Um, there are lots of places where the um, road is not really wide enough for cars to safely pass cyclists. But if, as with all these things, it's finding space in the current infrastructure to put in a cycle lane. Mm -hmm. And I know from discussions with um, disability groups and my own personal feeling that having a shared um, cyclist um, uh, pedestrian cyclist thing is not the answer because it just becomes more dangerous um yeah if it would be nice to be able to put the stand special on the roads mentioned um but they it would be a matter of possibly moving um on street parking in lots of these areas to get the physical space and that her, putting in a cycle lane has proved to be virtual um, in other areas of the borough. Um, I know there's most notably Kew Gardens, um, long there we put a new cycle route, well Alex put a new cycle route along, but I know there's a keenness within the um, council to um, promote active travel and yes cycle lanes would is one of the main things to be brought in yes. but Thanks. it's a matter of where we can put them in without negatively impact other road users too much and also if i just add on to that the particular roads that have been brought up um so warren road for example um a lot of people who live on warren road are not able to have driveways because of the, um, the the measurements that one has to have in order to be able to have a crossover and a driveway in front of your house and so if one is going to take away all that parking in order to put a cycle lane and I'm not saying that that wouldn't be but one of the things that has to be taken into consideration is that you could end up with a whole lot of people not being able to park anywhere near where they live um, and so that has to be it, it really has to be a balance between um, active travel which is extremely important we know that uh, air pollution levels in Whitney and Heathfield are, are of a, at an unacceptable level um, but we have to get that balance between the active travel and uh, other road users um, you know that balance has to be struck and yep. we also have to um, 
also put lots of emphasis and working hopefully with TfL and other organisations to improve public transport to Witten and Heathfield because we have a low uh, TPOL score as we all uh, know um, and the, the, the way to get people to be more active in travel is to have a better public transport infrastructure so we've got to it's lots of different strands that have to be put uh, pulled together um, but I think we've all got the same um, uh, ambition which is to reduce car usage uh, have more people uh, you, you to, uh, being able to use public transport walking and cycling and sort out our air pollution levels because they, they are unacceptably high. Okay, Councillor, thank you very much. Councillors, thank you very much. I promised everybody we would finish at eight o'clock and indeed the clock has just reached eight. I'm sorry we didn't get the questions about uh, crossings opposite Milkshake Nursery on Warren Road. Uh, I'm sorry we didn't uh, manage to talk. Paul, to sorry, could I just very jump quick in because that's Warren Road again. We are currently talking with council officers about Warren Road okay. um, because there is a great big gap between the counts, the crossing outside the corner shop on Alton Gardens okay. and all the way up to Milkshake. So um, Caroline, absolutely. Um, we're looking at trying to put an additional crossing in somewhere, uh, looking at the speeds along that road uh, and, and everything else. So um, that, that's, that's covered, thank you. And Greg, he says that going to Murray Road, one of the great, great pleasures is meeting the dogs there. So don't get rid of them all. Right, councillors, residents, thank you so much. We're one minute over, I'm sorry about that. You are free now to go and eat, drink and make merry, uh, particularly though, if you live in Percy Road, where literally you can all just nip next, next door for a glass of wine or whatever. Anyway, have yourselves a good evening. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for taking part. Well done.